Dean Delaney will have a discussion with Jonathan for about 35 to 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Please type in your questions in the Q&A box, and we'll get try to get through as many questions as we can. With that, uh, Dean Delaney, I'd like to hand it over to you to start our program. Thank you, Ayman, and uh, welcome everyone who's on the webinar. This has been a wonderful series for us as it gives us a chance to highlight some of our successful alumni. Uh, the pursuit of excellence in academia, within the community, through organizational leadership and otherwise is core to the professional identity of Dr. Jonathan Mathis. His work spans both secondary and post-secondary educational institutions with a focus on college access and success. He was appointed to serve as executive director of the Next Step Public Charter School uh, for Washington, D.C. in December 2017. In this role, he's provided vision and leadership for a learning community serving up to 500 adult learners ages 16 to 30 with a focus on college and career readiness. Prior to this appointment, he served as the inaugural director of the National Honor Societies at the National Association of Secondary School Principals. His efforts impacted nearly 2 million students, advisors, and leaders annually. Dr. Mathis has also served as director of education and training at the National Association for College Admission Counseling, where he was responsible for professional learning and leadership preparation for more than 14,000 college admission professionals. He earned a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration degree from the Kogod School at American University, shout out Kogod, a Master of Science in Administration for Educational Administration from Trinity Washington University, and he completed his doctoral degree in urban education policy at the University of Southern California. Dr. Mathis continues his commitment to the field by providing executive leadership through volunteer board service to American University Alumni Association, where we're proud to say he currently serves as president and thought leadership through national presentations to advance student achievement in educational leadership in both secondary and post-secondary educational environments. We're proud that you're able to join us today, Jonathan. And one thing I'll say to all of our listeners is a business school degree can prepare you for employment across the professions. And we'll get into some discussion today about the fact that many of the activities that um, are on a day-to-day -day basis in Jonathan's assignments require him to use business skills. So as a result, there's a lot that we can all learn from the way he has applied his business knowledge um, to one of the most important areas um, of interest in the United States. And in particular, at a time where we have a pandemic, where there is an economic crisis and where education is becoming particularly important given the role that technology is playing, finding ways to help students, particularly adult learners, people who may have been missed by the traditional processes, helping them gain skills that allow them to have career and life success are critical. And we're proud of what you're doing there, Jonathan, because it's something that's necessary. Now, we normally take a, a regular process in these webinars. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to grill Jonathan on his background because we want everyone to get a sense of him as he starts. So, you know, Jonathan, thank you for being here. And as we start today, could you tell the audience just a little bit about your background, where you're from, and also sort of what led you to American University? 
Sure. Let me start by saying thank you again, Dean Delaney and your team for making this possible. I, I am truly grateful for the chance to share and to reflect with the Kogod community and certainly grateful for the richness of investment that Kogod has been for me. So I start with gratitude. Uh, my background, so I always like to share that I played school as a kid, right? I was the kid in the neighborhood who would find such joy in running my makeshift classroom and imitating the excellence of educators that I saw all day. Uh, but I have an older brother who uh, was in the college search three years prior to me thinking about where I would attend. And I began looking through all of the view books and marketing materials to see where I wanted to attend based off of where he did not want to attend. So I would look at the marketing and see what campuses looked like at every time of the year. And DC had always been a special place. So American University was top of my list almost immediately because I had access to who AU was uh, and, and their marketing materials when I started high school. Then my junior year, I attended the National Young Leaders Conference and it was housed at the National 4-H Center just down the street from AU. So for that entire week, I drove past campus and I continued to say to myself, that's where I wanna be. I wanna study business. I want to have a focus in education. I want to have a focus in public administration. Like I had a long list of all the things that I wanted to study and AU continued to check everything off of that list. So my desire to be in the nation's capital, my desire to be uh, a part of change at a national level, federal level, and to understand leadership at a federal level became you know, center for my decision around college attendance. I applied to AU early decision and it was my Christmas break of my senior year that I actually talked my family into making a trip down to DC. And I was on campus while uh, the students were on a winter break. And I actually ran into my academic advisor in Kogat just by chance. And I shared that I had been accepted early decision and we began to talk about my journey at Kogat. So my AU story starts with playing school as a kid and then also benefiting from the decision making of my older brother as to where I may need to focus my attention and being in the nation's capital truly remains uh, a critical decision for me. Well, Jonathan, I have to say we're really fortunate that your brother decided he didn't want to go to AU <laughs> or else you might have been someplace else. I think I still would have found my way to DC, but <laughs> truly, truly. Yeah, it's can you tell us one fun fact about yourself, things you like to do just to relax and enjoy life? So I love the arts. I love uh, anything pertaining to uh, art, music, culture, but I particularly love couture fashion. So one of my dreams is to attend a Paris Fashion Week and you know possibly tour some ateliers or uh, have a chance to learn even more about, you know, couture fashion and why, you know, why not just dive into your interest. And it is so far from the work that I do every day. It just gives me a chance to continue to learn and find passion in the things that really intrigue me and inspire me. So that would be top of my list of random fun facts. I think that's great because it also illustrates uh, something for the audience that at times, if we reach out to things that we don't normally do, something different, it can really cause us to think differently and can inspire ideas that help us in the main job or other pursuits that we have. Um, okay. Now, what was the experience like when you were at Koga, Jonathan? And, and you know, did you have a favorite professor? Are there people you stay in touch with? Uh, sure. So I stayed on the north side of campus my first two years at AU. So I was in the McDowell Hall residence hall and the Hughes Hall residence hall. So Colgate was literally my neighbor. Um, so I would say the Colgate experience for me began with this deep knowledge tool and disposition around like, what does it mean to lead and learn continuously? how do the business skills apply across the board? And in every class, that was the conversation, right? How do we investigate the challenges and successes 
of industries that we may not even focus on or may not have thought about, but what are the tools or what are the takeaways from those industry successes and failures that could be applicable to almost any space? So my co-god experience for me was constant inquiry, constant sharpening of tools and the questions that one should ask when looking at an organization for their profitability, for their ethical practices. Uh, so for me, that acumen stays with me and is present in what I do every day. Uh, in terms of professors, I remember fondly Professor Duru for managerial accounting. And it was his enthusiasm, his expertise, his commitment to student success, uh, that stuck with me over and, and, it, and it continues to inform how I create the aha moments when I'm teaching or when I'm engaging with graduate students uh, as an adjunct professor. For me, he always provided an exemplar of what extraordinary teaching looked like, but it was his energy more than anything. I think the class was a block class uh, or maybe it was, a I know it was in the afternoon or evening. So it was after you had made it through the day. And then it was like, how do you get excited about managerial accounting? Well, Professor Duru will pull you in, will engage you in the discussion. And for me, I, I remember that fondly. And I think about his example uh, as to what it means to be an extraordinary uh, teacher and educator. Now, my classmates would say the same. I have, I have a good number of uh, Koga classmates who remain very close to me and a part of my network as I, you know, as I think about continue to grow and reflect on my experience since AU. And a number of my colleagues from Koga have gone on to master's degrees and some even uh, doctoral work, depending on their experience. But we all continue to reflect on the success of it and achievement. And we continue to sharpen one another as we did, as we prepare for exams with COGOD, the late study sessions, uh, some of my colleagues studied abroad and we continue to just connect and reflect on our AU experience. But more importantly, some of the takeaways that continue to sharpen us as professionals today. So my network is still very much heavy AU <laughs> and actually one of my AU COGOD classmates uh, she actually went on to study and do her PhD out in California as well. So you had two COGOD alum working on their dissertations, still studying and writing together. Uh, so Bernadette Galliard, I give her a quick shout out because we both left COGOD uh, and went on to do PhDs in California. And I think that that's great because it's also a testament to the wide range of places that people went after um, being in business school. But I've got a, a quick question. Augustine yeah. Duru wanted to give his best to you today. Well, he had something that he had to do, a family issue, and wasn't able to be here. But here's the question, because I, I really like Augustine very much, and he's a sharp dresser, and he'll wear a suit and tie and a baseball hat. Was he wearing <laughs> the baseball hat when he taught your class? I remember, you know, there were times where it would be raining or the weather would be horrible and Professor Duo would come through as if, you know, he was ready to take on the world. And it was just that presence that, you know, it made you excited about being in class that day, especially accounting, right? Like, how do you make that? For me, that was where I struggled. Like, how do I find such joy in that area? But it was all about like the connection that he helped us to, to get to the content and the, uh, that I'll never forget. So he definitely was a sharp dresser. His presence definitely made the difference. And when you were at Koga, Jonathan, did you have any vision of where your career might go? Because I want to get to the, the question of, did the path sort of go directly or indirectly to where you are today? That's a really great question. <clears throat> when I arrived to AU, I had two goals in mind. I either wanted to be a judge or I wanted to create my own school or both. I, I never pursued the legal area. However, my, my mother would you know, beg to differ. I'm a great negotiator, arguer. I'm, I'm very good at that, she would tell you. Uh, but my experience at COGOD was really focused on what are the skills, what are the leadership dispositions that I can take anywhere? And I knew that education was and it remains the core to my work. So for me, I knew that I wanted to have a deep impact on the field of education, 
with the lens of organizations, management, leadership, and the efficiency and effectiveness of schools as organizations. So in a roundabout way, I knew that the business background was going to be critical for me while also coupled with, you know, as a McNear scholar during my time at AU, I was doing research focused on the induction and mentoring of new teachers coupled with my business coursework. So it was, for me, it was the perfect marrying of two very distinct topics, but the connection and the alignment between what is critical for business, what is critical for organization, what is critical for school rang to be so true. And for the audience, I wanna call out the point Jonathan just made because it's really important. The notion that opportunities exist at the intersection of different areas is critical. If you can apply your business expertise, whether it's in marketing or finance, to a problem, and it could be in nonprofit management, it could be an international service, it's a great way to make a difference and build a career. And while Jonathan may or may not agree with me, I would say that he's done a wonderful job of taking those types of business and some other skills from AU and using them in a way that's going to allow him to lead an educational organization forward. Um, and Delaney, and- one thing I'll add too that was absolutely critical for my experience When I was in my PhD program at USC, I actually, my cognate was in management and organizations. So I was able to, again, pull from my experience in COGOT to further my graduate education as well. And that allowed me to, again, fine tune the the nature of high performing organizations, effective leadership, Uh, Even when you think about partnerships, sustainability, social entrepreneurship, those are all extremely critical topics that are transferable and I would say almost imperative for any and every industry. Uh, Yeah, and, you know, I think we could even go further and say um, there are topics that we need to get people to understand at younger ages because some of those issues um, however important they are, don't necessarily register with people when they're younger. And, you know, I, given the um, position that you're in now, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about uh, Next Step Charter School and sort of weave in how your background allows you to be successful there and maybe get at some of these issues because Um, the efforts you make to train young people so that they can move towards successful careers are critical. And you're in a a field that is too small right now. We have too many people who are left out for a variety of reasons. So it would be great if you could um, give us some guidance on this and then that will move us to some other questions too. Absolutely. So the role of executive director in a charter school looks more like a superintendent in a traditional K-12 environment. So in the seat of executive director, I am responsible for nearly 100 staff, up to 500 learners, a budget of 10 plus million dollars annually, as well as any sort of engagement with the advocacy across city leaders, across federal policy, anything that pertains to a charter school as as to our authorizers. So the entity that says this school can exist and the entity that defines all of the accountability measures, I am engaging with those parties and with those, let's say, areas of focus. My scope of work would include any legal matter, marketing and engagement, recruiting and retaining high performing teams and individuals, while also cultivating partnerships so that our students have really positive outcomes as a result of attending at the next step. And, you know, what I'm so grateful for is I have about eight or nine colleagues who are leading similar schools in the district. So together we have a coalition mentality to support one another as we lead uh, advocacy, as we consider the impacts of the realities of the day on our school. So 
even outside of my organization. Effective teaming is critical, leadership, engagement, vision, partnership. But I think the biggest piece that I would say that I, I attribute so, so strongly back to Cole God is sustainability. How do you create and lead an entity, a mission-driven nonprofit organization that is sustainable? How do you ensure that you have the resources, the, the right people, the right team, the right structure so that you can continue to thrive and excel in such an uncertain time? Uh, so for me, that is you know, a, a brief snapshot of the scope of work for me, one thing to also note is that the, the school that I'm responsible for operates from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Monday through Thursday and 9 to 6 on Friday. So when you think about just the operations, I'm so grateful for a strong team that manages what happens inside and outside of the school building. But as an executive director, you also have to think about facilities planning and maintenance and depreciation of assets. All of those things that, again, tie back to accounting and other resources, that's a part of my everyday conversation, especially during the infamous budget season, which is what I'm in right now. And I actually had a call uh, a bit earlier today with the chief operating officer forecasting various models of revenue depending on enrollment and what that would mean for our net operating income. So like all of these, these line items are coming back to me in a very palpable way that I cannot escape it, especially when we're thinking about a, a sustainable, thriving organization. Well, I think when Professor Duru watches the recording of this, he'll be <laughs> proud that you're using your accounting. Oh, every uh, day. <laughs> I, I want to ask you one thing, not about accounting, but more about leadership. Sure. Because in the position that you're in, you have to lead not just staff who might be your direct reports, but a broader set of staff. You need to lead um, students. You need to lead people from the community. And I refer to leadership broadly because when you're interacting, whether it's with a politician or a business person in the community, your ability to um, interact effectively could make a difference in terms of opportunity. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you do that, whether you're using a deliberate approach or whether it's just your personality. Great, I appreciate that question. You know, one of the things that remains core to me is this idea of servant leadership. And especially in the field of education and in the work that I do outside of my professional commitments, the idea for me is how might I serve such that the quality of life, the experience, the capacity, the empowerment of others is priority and is advanced to a degree that maybe they didn't even expect, right? So I have this professional mantra of cultivating transformational experiences. And that goes with me, whether I'm serving at the next step, whether it's board service to the alumni association, board service to new futures, that philosophy says, you know, I'm interested in the success of other people's children, quite frankly. I am interested in advancing their dreams to reality faster. So how I serve is very much so that their dreams are advanced. Uh, I, I have to put myself second in that philosophy, but I also have to center that work to say, you know, as someone who's uh, interested in continuing continuous learning, I want to sharpen my skills so that I can best serve those who I engage. Uh, so for me, leadership as a continuum is very much so as leader as servant. That also requires at times to operate with like discernment and empathy and also a willingness to empower and to distribute leadership. So if I can provide vision, describe vision with the community that I'm leading, it's easier for me to pull back to say, this is something we created, but you can lead. It's not something that I, I certainly don't need to carry. I would love to see everyone finding great ownership and accountability as we make what is seemingly impossible possible, but certainly again, around this notion of the transformational experience. 
and sustainable experience. And that requires me to serve as leader and to put others first. I think that that's great because it also gets at the fact that to lead, you have to understand, which means you have to listen. Yes. And the external environment can have a tremendous effect. It can cause us to have to change the plans we have because we suddenly realize there's a disconnection. And what I wanted to get at with regard to that is, you know, how has the social justice and equity issues of the day affected what you're doing both at Next Step and also in the leadership approaches that you're taking? Because that external environment has changed and it's something that good leaders can't ignore. It's a, it's a perfect question and I, I tend to reflect on this often with my team. I, I'm so lucky to have not only an executive coach, but a, a team of leaders who I would call the management team. And we speak a lot about how might we ensure that students are ready to learn? How might we dive deeply into like Maslow's hierarchy of needs and get to the basic needs, especially now, especially during times of great uncertainty, how might we as an organization meet those needs so that we can prepare a space for students to learn? So specifically for us, we have had to design, develop, and launch emergency relief efforts within our organization. Now, that has allowed us to raise about $47,000 within a very short period of time to offer micro grants to our learners, such that if they're experiencing disruption in income, we as an organization are able to find ways to close some gaps, but also to say, we are truly here for you. We want to ensure your success. Uh, we continue to provide, you know, I, I call it, you know, actually a colleague of mine calls it intrusive advising, right? Mm -hmm. How do we get to the core stumbling blocks that, you know, students experience that are equity issues? And then how does our advocacy to our deputy mayor for education, our council members, how do we share those stories and those needs such that it informs policy. And then the same thing internally, how do we as a community have this ever evolving pivoting organization in a time where there's not only there's uncertainty with the economy, there's spaces of unrest and you know the very much palpable uh, social justice issues that we have experienced and our students have experienced. How do we create a safe space that's trauma informed but again, how do we remove the obstacles so that students' dreams become reality faster? How do we make sure that council members, leaders understand the unintended consequences of policy? But then also, how do we as an organization remain nimble, flexible, mission aligned, and still have extraordinary outcomes? And that has required us to be nimble, to be empathetic, to be responsive, and to be consistent. My guess is that the pandemic has accelerated your uh, focus on being nimble uh, because it has to have had a deep effect on the students that um, you're serving. Certainly it's affected everything that we're doing in higher education. And I, I wonder um, whether there have been any lessons that have come from that that you're going to take post pandemic when yes. we get back to normal. <laughs> right. And, you know, one of the things that I've heard from our teachers is that, you know, our students definitely miss that sense of connection. But there are times where the uh, asynchronous learning and the self-directed learning has come to the advantage for students, right, especially for our parenting students. If we can have robust, dynamic, responsive technologies that would support our adult learners, when they are ready. So like just in time learning or modules, mm -hmm. some of those particular approaches would be important while also remaining a hybrid functional, you know, uh, adult school, right? How do we ensure that our learners across the various academic needs are getting the dynamic and uh, responsive education while also making sure that it's a sustainable approach and we're still giving the quality of instruction that supports student academic development. So that is really a core to how we're thinking right now. How do we maintain 
a hybrid adaptive approach while also creating dynamic synchronous experiences for our learners? And how do we support the teachers and leaders to navigate those technologies with great ease? And then how do you fund those technologies <laughs> with great ease? Uh, so that's where we're at right now, planning for today, planning for next year, planning for five years from now. Yeah, and one of the things that technology has done is that um, it's made people think that every time I engage with a technical device, it's going to be fun. Right. And if you've got that kind of view, when we talk about education, it makes our job even harder because, to your point, we've got to we've got to set things up in a way that it's not the boring lecture. There's got to be some element of it that's enjoyable, even if it's not truly fun. I don't know if you've got any comments on that, um, yeah. but that's a challenge we're facing in the university level too. Yes, and you know, I am so grateful for the faculty at the next step. One of the, uh, I, I'll describe it as an intervention, but one of the pivots that we took this spring uh, we introduced passion projects. So more so like project-based learning or, and I remember I, it may have been during my time at AU, but this idea of like the last lecture series where faculty members get a chance to share something so dynamic if it were one of their last lectures. So we had to step away from just simply presenting content for the GED or for ESL to wrap it around the passion, the, the passion, the purpose of that particular faculty member or the students were sharing what they were passionate about. And there was a, an academic experience around that. So for example, if it were uh, an ESL class that focused on marketing or sports advertising or something to that effect, the entire course was focused on how do we make sure that students are getting the academic skill but how are we connecting this so deeply to something that they're passionate about? Uh, so that project-based learning or even like a case approach, that has definitely been something that has worked well, not only for our students, but it gives our faculty members another chance to fall in love with the content that brought them to teaching, right? In this new way, but also it lightened the pressure of the time, right? We were positioning passion projects in about May so about two months into COVID-19 stay at home order, we transitioned to this passion project and did that through the summer. And the results were fantastic. The, the engagement, the excitement about learning, it, it was really a dynamic pivot for us. Uh, and it's certainly on the one hand, it's a lot has changed since that day yep. when everything went online. Um, but it still seems like Groundhog's Day. Yes. And I wonder if you could, if you've got any uh, thoughts on what you see as hopeful from the Biden administration going forward now, because everybody is hoping we're moving towards the tail end of the pandemic. Um, and with all the change that's taken place, uh, you know, there's a lot of issues out there. Absolutely. You know, I, I remain hopeful and optimistic about the increased support for educational institutions and the dynamic nature, attention to the dynamic nature of accountability and student achievement during this time. Uh, we understand that, you know, student learning loss is significant, but if there is a willingness for this administration to think about the investments that would address learning loss in a more holistic, comprehensive way. Uh, and especially with Dr. Jill Biden being familiar with education and her advocacy and support of school counseling and having greater counselors, all of those factors uh, are what make the difference for the student's readiness to learn. And for me, that includes investments in directly to students, but also teachers and leaders. How do we cultivate the instructor and the principal school leader to be ready to navigate and pivot technology, uh, the uncertainty, and even the increased need for mental health and wellness understandings in the classroom, but also how might the administration consider the needs for self-care, the needs for 
a, a space for the, the individuals, not just in education, but across the industries who have been at the front line, who have tried to maintain some consistency, continuity, and norm, how might those individuals experience even greater support as they try to advance the next phase of their work with re-entry or re-engagement in person? So I remain hopeful for this comprehensive, holistic approach with greater investment directly to school leaders, school uh, teachers, uh, support for out of school time learning for students. But again, how do we ensure the infrastructure of school is sustained even as we move to hybrid and then to in-person? How do we ensure that someone like me, a school leader who is trying to balance a budget with great uncertainty, how do we remove some of that uncertainty so that we can ensure student success and the sustainability and achievement of our schools? I think that the pandemic has created an interesting experiment in education right now too, in the sense that everybody has had to adjust. I wonder if you could comment a little bit on the potential challenges and opportunities that you see for charter schools, you know, as we go through the pandemic towards the future. Absolutely. You know, when I think about charter schools in particular, one of the pieces that always attracted me to charters is the design is very much to be innovators, collaborators, to pilot and pivot at a given moment, right? The autonomy and flexibility of charters hopefully will continue to cultivate lessons learned that could help our colleagues in a traditional K-12 setting. In particular, the ability to adapt a school schedule to have uh, comprehensive innovative supports and interventions for students to remain nimble and responsive and to partner with parents in ways that may not be seen with traditional K-12 settings, you know, hopefully the charters can share and will continue to share their best practices, the lessons learned. Um, I, I would say in particular, the ways in which charters have engaged students and families uh, to, to be attractive against the K-12 environment is something that we'll have to continue. But the, the question for you know, myself as a leader of a charter school is, you know, how, how might I do that with great sustainability? Where might there be chance for even greater collaboration and partnership with post-secondary institutions as we smooth out pipelines from K-12 to college and university? How might we also smooth out even greater pipelines for career opportunities for adult learners who are trans transitioning back into industry into the workforce. So I think that there's great opportunity to spell out, you know, how do we have seamless re-entry and seamless achievement pathways, but how do we as schools, especially in charters, how might we collaborate and partner with the greater, you know, society, business, industry, et cetera, to make sure that we're sustained, that we can accelerate learning, that we can make learning relevant and palpable, right? Similar to those passion projects, how might we partner with community to, to ensure that the learning that is happening now reflects the leaders that are needed for the future? Well, I think it's been clear in recent years that there's a real role that uh, charters uh, can play in terms of education. And if that, if, that hypothesis proves to be correct that I've just made. What do you see as some of the challenges that will come about as you grow? Um, because one of the, the problems I think many school systems have is as you get to a certain size, it's more difficult to deliver the kind of you know, personalized approach that you're able to do right now. For growth for us, uh, you know, the, the question is really around sustainability. So you're, to your point, if we have a model that works, if we were to, you know, franchise, you know, lack of a better term, franchise that model, how do we replicate that structure such that we can guarantee the same experience if we had less dollar, if we had greater limitation? You know, I think about DC, the biggest challenge for a new school is space, right? <laughs> How do you find space enough to grow your program, grow your school? 
And then also as you grow and deliver the program, if 73 to 75% of your expense is people, how do you replicate that capacity in a second site? How do you also maintain enrollment in a highly competitive market of other incredibly high performing charters, right? So if you're growing within a saturated market, how might you reimagine who you serve and where in the pipeline you're serving? It may not be a, a good fit to grow just as you are, but you may think about growing at a different point in the same trajectory, right? So if I were leading a middle school, a five to eight, uh, five grades five to eight, my growth might be extending down to pre-K three to four, or extending up to nine through 12 versus replicating another five to eight model. So you, we, we as charters in DC in particular have to think about that market piece, the sustainability, the retention, the space, uh, and again, bringing it back to the dollar. How can we do this well if, if we have to uh, compete for funding? Yeah, and I'm going to sound like a broken record here, Jonathan, but I want to say to the audience that, wow, that really ties back all those business courses because Absolutely. many of the challenges that you're facing require leaders to have um, at least some knowledge across accounting, finance, management. Um, if you don't have that, it would be much more difficult to be successful in this environment, which is likely going to get more competitive and more challenging as we go forward. And sort of with that, I'd like to segue a little bit that um, since I've sort of pushed up the question towards our students, do you have any advice that you might give to students that will help them? And it's not as much that they should be just like you in the sense of going into charter schools, but they should be just like you in terms of, you know, creating a path that allows them to be strong servant leaders in the organization that they choose? You know, I appreciate this question as it's, I always think about this as like the legacy question. What is the Colgate legacy? What, how might I contribute to it? What might I share? Uh, I would say, you know, one of the first things I would share with students, especially Colgate students, is to think about how you might cultivate authentic connection right, especially as we're thinking about an even more competitive workspace and workforce, how might you build relationships through informational interviews? How might you participate in research opportunities with faculty members so that you understand not only the theory into practice, but you're cultivating theory and new knowledge. So if there's a chance for you to learn about the field or create research about the field, that to me remains at the top one thing that I would say I benefited the most from is service. I, while a COGAT student, I volunteered in an elementary school. I was deeply involved in leadership opportunities on campus. And it was because of those service experiences, I could say I helped to manage large scale programming. I managed budgets. I negotiated contracts and partnerships, things that might not have been the traditional college graduate resume, right? Because of my service experience. And even now, not on the alumni board, but I serve on another nonprofit board and I've served on a, a school's board and it helped me to understand exactly what questions I should be asking, the expertise that was needed, but also it increased my network of other individuals with whom I could reflect and strategize around my next steps. The last thing that I would say is that the COGOT student rule need to remain well-rounded in their job and internship search. So this, this headline, you know, cultivating transformational experiences, business students can do that in any and all fields. The question is for the COGOT student, what is your passion? What are you most excited about? What, uh, what, it excites your learning and you know your commitment and combine that with your skills and expertise. I can promise you in almost, if not every field, in almost every field, there is a need for business acumen for an organization to survive, thrive and excel. But that's where you can have that perfect balance, right? If you are interested in arts 
and you have a business background, then you can continue to arts management. If you're interested in education or if you have a, an interest in a particular skill or hobby, how do you connect that to your business skill and go after jobs and internships that are beyond the traditional top five, top 10 firms to cultivate an experience and a pathway that will ensure your success, but your chance to grow and lead in an industry that may not have been uh, you know, the, the most popular industry. And you'll find great success when you can marry your passion and your purpose. Yeah, and I'm going to sneak one more question, and I see that Iman's here, uh, and he will take over in a second, but it gets at that, and the pandemic has created a situation that's really broken the frames of reference that we've had in many areas of life, and I wondered if you might comment just a little bit on the opportunities that you see as a result of that, because as an educator, I'm sure that you're paying attention to where trends are going and I'll bet that you've got some insights that people would be interested in hearing. One of the first things that I say before getting to the content is the work-life balance. I, I know that I have struggled with stepping away from work and I think self-care and the intentionality of balance is going to be absolutely critical. But the, the piece with remote work that I would encourage all students to think about is how do you cultivate teaming? How do you manage projects in very dynamic, fluid ways? How do you manage uncertainty? How do you manage change? Those are dispositions and skills that are hard at a, any given time, but managing change is probably one of the greatest challenge of a leader, period. And for students to, to pay very close attention to how they may cultivate those skills and dispositions, to me, that is one of the most important things. Coupled with that, how might leaders, learners continue to reinvent their skill set? How might they refine and adapt skills such, such that they can be productive and could have greater sustainability, creativity, and innovation in their particular industry? And much of that has to be self-directed and much of that has to be seen as an investment that you are worthy of and making time for that. But again, work-life balance, managing teams, projects, managing uncertainty, managing change, and redefining and adapting one skill are, are top of mind for me. Yeah, and I'm gonna turn it to Iman right now, but I, I also wanna say, Jonathan, that what you just said fits really well with the comment you made about the importance of our taking care of our own mental health because it's really hard to do that balancing if we don't have ourself in the right perspective. And the pandemic has knocked a lot of us off kilter just because of the changes that it has imposed. Um, with that, let me let Iman step in um, and I'll be quiet. Thanks, John, and thank you so much, Jonathan, for all of the insights. It's been a great discussion. A few questions. Uh, let me start off with a course. If you had to come back to the COVID School of Business and pick a course to take, I know your first choice would be probably a study abroad trip to Paris during Paris yes. Fashion yes. Week. <laughs> but <laughs> in addition to that, what else, what other course would you really would like to come back and take or study or get more in-depth understanding on? You know, I have toyed with coming back to Kogat for, for an MBA with a particular focus on uh, change, innovation, and change, innovation, and sustainability, right? Those are top of mind for me. And that's where I spend a great deal of my energy right now. So I, if there was a course on change, innovation, <laughs> sustainability, Absolutely, that would be what I would come back to Kogat for. And I continue to think about it, so who knows? I, I may be back. <laughs> Great, so we'll give a heads up to Professor Duru to get ready for all of those courses. <laughs> right. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Great question. Another question I had was your experience with the AU Alumni Board. Uh, what's your experience and moving forward, what would be your vision for that? 
You know, I have been so grateful. Again, service for me has allowed me to learn and refine skills that I may not have garnered in my professional work. So leading the alumni board gives me a chance to support and represent over 135,000 alum, alumni of our, our American University. And in particular, aligning with President Burwell's charge, Change Makers for a Changing World, has been so exciting and it has continued to inform and inspire my own leadership in my organization. So when I think about the alumni community and the alumni board in particular, we have defined uh, a number of goals and efforts that are specific to the three tenets of change makers for a changing world. So scholarship, learning, and community. When we think about scholarship, the alumni board and the alumni community, we wanna celebrate and elevate faculty contributions and see where our professional work can align with or shine a light on the incredible scholarship of faculty. With learning, and you saw this over the past year in particular, and I want to give a special shout out to the provost's office and the ways in which we've been able to engage alumni in the classroom. But this idea that the Alumni Association and the Alumni Board in particular can continue to advance the theory to practice discussion and how that reflects inside and outside of the classroom in and across industries for current and future eagles. And then when we think about this commitment to community, the Alumni Association and the alumni community in particular wish to collaborate with current Eagles and alumni to advance service projects as a form of engagement. You know, when I attended AU, the mantra was ideas and in, ideas into action, action into service, right? And that was something that's a mantra that I still believe in. But when we think about how we elevate change makers for a changing world, this gives us another opportunity to refine our skills and uh, for the alumni community to have a sense of engagement that is authentic and with great affinity. And lastly, an area that I'm personally interested in, and I know a number of the alumni association board members, uh, we would hold true to this idea of advancing philanthropic commitments that support the AU experience. Uh, and of particular interest for me is resources for access and equity, supporting students throughout their journey and the and ensuring that they have access to the AU experience as a whole. Thank you. So, and I agree with you, alumni are extremely important to engage as we move forward. How do we engage more alumni? You know, moments like this for me is really exciting, right? And, and if we think back to when, when we experienced the various furloughs and, and government shutdowns, there were points of engagement for our alumni to come back for a, a skill refresh or a, an opportunity to engage or to audit a class, right? If we are able to engage alumni around their purpose, around the work or the questions they're seeking to answer, I think that that would be a really great strategy. Also, asking alumni to offer their expertise or creating space for students to take on a challenge they may be facing. Uh, for me, I think that's a great way to bring alumni back because we know that in a time of great uncertainty, greater a number of minds, greater volume of minds to address a unique challenge could be definitely beneficial, but it also gives an AU student a chance to develop their portfolio with responses to contemporary issues. I think alumni would be instrumental in creating spaces for those experiences to happen. And then simply sharing where we are today. You know, when I think about my time at AU, COGOD didn't occupy the two spaces, right? The Butler Instructional Center was there. And it would just be important for people to understand just how much COGOD has grown, the stories of current and recent grads, uh, also where in which they can engage to elevate and support and even mentor current Eagles. I think those are all really important strategies for connection and affinity back to AU. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I want to be respectful of everybody's time, so I'll turn it back to Dean Delaney to close out. Well, what I'd say, Jonathan, is we've got the right person as president of the alumni board to do this engagement. Uh, I agree with you very much that one of the challenges now is to find 
the things we can do that allow alumni to self-actualize, the things we can do that help them. And the more we're doing that, as opposed to just a recipe book of events that we can have, the more we'll be able to, um, to draw on the specific skills that people have. And, you know, again, I'm reaching out to the audience, the, the fact that all these business skills have been so helpful to Jonathan as he's gone off in this education industry in a charter school, these are the same skills that will move forward in other areas. And, you know, maybe we'll leave with one more issue that if you are willing to talk about it and it gets at the area of sustainability. One of the biggest opportunities that's on the horizon now is sustainability is becoming much more prominent um, from the environmental side and then also in the organizational side because financial companies are going to be more and more accountable by ESG, that's environmental, social and governmental types of requirements as they try to manage their environment. And as a result, you know, Jonathan's point I think is really important because it says, we have to think about how we'll be sustainable in everything we do. And it doesn't mean environmental sustainability in all cases, it means what kind of practices do we need to follow in an organization that will help us um, continue to recruit the people we need to move the organization forward? And I wonder if you want to comment a little on this, Jonathan, because I see it as a huge area of opportunity coming forward. Absolutely. I, I, you, you hit it right on the, you know, the nail on the head for me with you know, when we think about sustainability, we have to consider, and I appreciate the ESG, right, the environment, social and governmental. There, there's also, with charters, it's a unique sector within a greater education conversation. So sustainability also includes a deeper public awareness of the import and the impact of a charter. And when we think about, you know, the the market and, and just the competition, how do we position this organization in such a way that other individuals leave their commitment to another space to join and to elevate and to accelerate the achievement and the growth of you know, this, a school like the next step. So sustainability for us is certainly all of those things while also thinking about how we fit in the sector. How do we ensure that we have rich financial resources that we can withstand, you know, such uncertainty like today and do it well? Very well said. And uh, what I'd like to do now in being respectful of everyone's time is to say thank you, Jonathan, for being here today. Thanks for just being such a great role model of a COGOT graduate, but also for um, being a wonderful representative of AU. And uh, we'll look forward to talking to you again. And um, Iman is in charge of our graduate program. So if you start getting emails about an MBA, you'll know where they're right. coming from. <laughs> well, and again, thank you. Thank you for the rich investment that Colgot has been for me in my journey. Uh, and thank you to the students, faculty, staff, alumni who will have a chance to participate. And, and certainly let's continue to be change makers for a changing world. Thank you. Thank you. Th thank you so much. And thank you everyone for signing into the webinar today. Take care, everyone.